I'm Ellis Martin. Join me for a conversation with Thomas Abraham James, President, CEO, and co-founder of Pulsar Helium. Pulsar Helium is a publicly traded company listed on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol PLSR. Pulsar's portfolio consists of the Topaz Helium Project in Minnesota and the Two New Helium Project in Greenland. Pulsar is the first mover in both locations with primary helium occurrences not associated with the production of hydrocarbons identified at each. Thomas, a geologist by trade, studied geology and earth sciences at the Australian National University. He's a fellow of the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, of the Geological Society of London, and the Society of Economic Geology. He's a former managing director of Helium One Global and founder, former CEO of Longland Resources. Tom, welcome to the program. It's fantastic to visit with you today. Yeah, a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me, Alice. You had a news release out today, and I'm going to read something from it. I hope you will clarify it and explain to our audience and to me what it means, because I can only guess at this. Ambient noise tomography. A-N-T, ant. It was in your news release today. What does it mean? Just rolls off the tongue beautifully, doesn't it? It's a bit technical, but the other name for it is passive seismic. So what it is, is that it's a very good tool for looking at depth. What's the geology like deeper down? The ambient part is that we don't induce the current. So typically with seismic, you're setting off dynamite at surface to get the shock waves, or you're using a truck, which is thumping up and down. Whereas this one is more enterprising, where you use the ambient noise that already exists. So for us, we're less than 10 miles away from North America's largest iron ore mine. And what do they do? They blast every other hour. So those shock waves from the blasting give us wonderful data. And then we just have nodes at surface that pick up this data and then we interpret it and it gives us a very good three-dimensional view of what's happening at depth. So they're doing all the destructive work, so to speak, and you're sitting there with your equipment, analyzing the data that you gather. And what is it telling you? What it tells us really what the, the major piece of news that we announced today is that for the first time, we've got really good clarity of what's happening at depth. So for us. The helium discovery that was made, so this is our project in Minnesota, 10.5% helium, fantastic. But typically, you gather all the data first, then you drill it, and then you confirm there's helium there. With our project, it was drilled first, magnificent discovery, and we're playing catch-up now to find out, okay, what's it look like at depth? How big is this thing? And so the seismic has told us that and it's just a wonderful correlation that it, it more or less exactly the depth where we hit the gas in the drill hole it's come up with this wonderful velocity anomaly, uh, which basically means that those shock waves are moving at a different speed, which suggests that there's a significant change in the geology at depth uh, at the precise location where the gas is. And then it extends down for another 600 meters to over a kilometer. And then laterally, it's open in all directions. So what that basically tells us is that we're looking at quite a large area that has the potential to host uh, helium. So it actually has given us wonderful insights as to how big this thing could be. So really, you're getting a look at what's happening underground before you have to spend any money and aimlessly put a well. You, you have a general area of where that well is going to be and where it might have the most return. Having said that, how many wells do you expect this land package at Topaz will have? Any idea? Look, at this moment, time's hard to say, but we've got a fairly decent-sized land package around the discovery. We start off cautiously and carefully, which is in February, we drill the appraisal well. That will be in a matter of feet of the original discovery. Whilst the seismic it gives us better clarity, it's already a very low risk drill program because you're drilling so close to a known discovery. What it does do is that uh, once we drill the appraisal, should it all be replicating the original results, then it gives us much better constraint on how big the reservoir is. So when we give all that data to the independent third party, will tell us what does the resource look like, it'll be far better constrained. And then I'm sure in the future, there'll be many additional holes as well. But it is worth mentioning at such high concentration, 10.5% again, you don't need that many holes for this thing to be quite lucrative. Other helium companies are out there with half a percent helium. And of course, you need a lot of holes to get the volume, but at 10.5%, one twentieth of the amount of gas is required to be processed. Well, it certainly makes it fairly economic. And speaking of economics, comparatively, in Rochester, Minnesota, just a few hours away from the Duluth area where your project is, lies the Mayo Clinic, one of the largest clinics in the world of its kind, and the support industry around it 
completely medical in every way. I imagine that your potential offtake partners are in the state of Minnesota. Yeah, there's quite a shift. So medical is a big use of the MRI scanners, breathing gases, for sure. The American Hospitals Association has been very vocal about the shortage of helium and what to do with it, prioritize it for hospitals. Also in the state of Minnesota, it's a big state for the manufacturing of semiconductors. The helium is essential for the fabrication of semiconductors. There's also industrial gas uh, distribution companies there as well. So really within a three hour drive of our project, we've got a significant mark. Are you already having some preliminary conversations informal? If you will. It would be rude not to introduce ourselves for sure. And with this helium uh, shortage, which has persisted for 10 years, I think that uh, speaking to these potential customers uh, in Minnesota, I think that they're in a state of disbelief, to be honest. It almost seems too good to be true because most helium comes from the Western states or indeed the world's largest producer now, which is the nation of Qatar. So a long way away. This must have figured into your calculus where you transition from traditional mining into basically gas. No, look, the, the difference with the helium and then the mining industry, it's huge. But the one thing I can say is helium could be compared to say the precious metals, right? and then you've got your base metals, which is then your more sort of commonplace gases. So oxygen, argon, CO2, they could be compared to your base metals, nickel, copper, and so on. Whereas helium is just really such an extraordinary value that the only comparable would be in the mining space, your gold, platinum, palladium. So what are you doing in Greenland? Yeah, Greenland's our project there. Just announced earlier is that the license area has increased in size. The key thing with that is, is that we want to incorporate this additional bit of uh, ground that has been identified as having big potential, not only for helium, where it's one of the places that we sampled the other year, but also for geothermal energy. We're looking into doing a collaboration with groups in Iceland, which is the home of geothermal power, to then see if we can get that working in Greenland as well. So with Greenland, we realized that the Logistically, it's challenging and that one of the key components that's lacking is energy. And to be able to identify a, a green source of energy that's reliable in that geothermal is a really key component to the project. Whilst our focus is on getting Minnesota up and running with production as quickly as possible, certainly not lacking with activity in Greenland. Next year, the intention is very much is to build up the first resource there. We've identified the helium. Now it's finding how much is there. How soon can we possibly expect Topaz to be in production in Minnesota? Look, it all goes according to the master plan. It can move relatively quickly, to be honest. We're on private mineral rights, private surface rights. So that certainly helps with the permitting side of things. In terms of the plant itself, fabrication time, you're probably looking at about six months. Our mindset is that we would start with production of gaseous helium and then build up to liquid helium, which has got a longer fabrication time for the plant. So look, long way of answering your question, should the, the planets sort of align, there's no reason why 12 months shouldn't be something that we're aiming for. I have to ask this because it's a concern of pretty much any investor. No permitting issues in Minnesota to speak of? No, Minnesota is the state to be in. So really for us, in terms of our drill program, we're fully permitted. We're all ready to go. Even the site works have been completed and the rig contracts in place. Nothing stopping us, Ellis. I like to hear that. Tom, it's always great to catch up with you. Thank you so much for joining me today in the program. I wish you a happy holiday and I look forward to chatting with you next year. Happy holidays to you too, mate. Thank you. I've been speaking with Thomas Abraham James, President, CEO, and Co-Founder of Pulsar Helium. Pulsar Helium trades on the TSX Venture Exchange as PLSR. Find the company at PulsarHelium.com. I'm Ellis Martin. Subscribe to the Ellis Martin Newsletter. It's free. Go to EllisMartinReport.com and fill out the quick and easy pop-up form.